As we are gathered here together, here's what the Lord commands. Shout joyfully to Yahweh all the earth and serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It's he who made us, not we ourselves. We are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness extends to all generations. Let us together invoke our God. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. And with those words of the elders, the four living creatures, the 12 uh, or the 24 elders there, we now are able to praise the name of our God together and hear the response of your king to you. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Amen. Let us then affirm that we are indeed here to give praise to the one who is worthy, the lamb who was slain and the one who sits on the throne and to the spirits who bring to us the word of life. Let us then profess together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection from the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. For those who have any confusion on some of the things we see here, when it speaks of him who is and who was and the seven spirits, the seven is not seven holy spirits, but rather the one spirit of God who is perfect and complete and sees all. And it is in that way that we then profess we believe in the singular Holy Spirit. Let us now sing from Psalms 46, a mighty fortress is our God, the great reformation hymn that affirms that our comfort lies not in ourselves, but rather in the God who is and who rules heaven and earth, a mighty fortress.
Please be seated. We speak of this great King in whom we place all of our confidence. Let us therefore be mindful of what this King has revealed and let us know his will together. Beloved, let us then respond as we read, speaking of the use and purpose of the revelation of God. The word of God is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In his word, he tells us what is good and what he requires of us, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But instead, we ignore the clear commands and perform acts not required by God, ceremonies, fastings, prayer vigils, making unnecessary vows, which have only the appearance of wisdom. But we will not humble ourselves, give up our sins, and obey the plain commands of God. All of us have sinned, and the wages of our sin is death. In this introduction, we want you to be comforted and be assured God wants you to know his mind, his will. He doesn't hide it. But there's also the great human danger. We don't like what God says, so we try to come up with substitutes, alternatives to present. We don't negotiate with the king. The king speaks, we must hear. So let us hear then, as Jesus summarized the law, that it was love the Lord your God with heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Well, we see he got that from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and Leviticus. You shall love Yahweh your God. However, we have abandoned the love we had at first. You have a reputation as a believer and as a church of being alive, but really you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die for I have not found your works complete. In fact, I know your works. You're neither hot nor cold. I'll spit you out of my mouth. Although you knew God, you did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in your thinking, claiming to be wise. You became fools. Leviticus 19. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So an explanation. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who passes judgment. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Brother goes to law against brother. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for it is to this work that you are called, that you may obtain a blessing. We try to look at the law in various parts of scripture, first the direct commandments, but also their explanations, but also where we look at the general spirit and tenure of the law, especially since Jesus said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor summarizes and lets you know how to fulfill the law rightly. Why is this important? Because we are naturally moralistic and prideful. We want something doable that we are able to say, look, I did these things or I refuse to do these things, even others are doing them. And we want to be able to show them to God and say, see why I'm lovable compared to those people. And we make it where God only remains as judge and we're constantly trying to impress him. But God says, no, what I want you to actually know is that I am the God who made this entire creation as a place very good so that men may enjoy the blessings. And when your father sinned against me and when you've continued that sin, I loved you so much I gave my only begotten son. So you fulfill the law by acknowledging I am God and a loving God, generous beyond measure. And I expect you then, if you are my children, that that character reflects on how you deal with those who bear my image. So you can see, he says, you've abandoned your love. You no longer love me, the God who made everything and sent his son. You only think of me as a judge who is just keeping an eye on you to give you a ticket or punish you. But I don't want that. I want you to have a zeal. Re restore to that love. Give me thanks when you recognize how many good gifts I give you each and every day. And as for dealing with others, 
again, we fall into that moralistic trap. I won't kill you, I won't steal from you, but don't expect much more from me. And yet we're told, if you don't forgive others, it's because you don't belong to the God as Father who forgives. That spirit's not in you, and therefore your sins will not be forgiven. And in fact, knowing that you are sons and daughters of God who loved us while we were his enemies, expect to have his character imprinted on you. And that means you suffer wrong from others and you live peaceably and in fact you bless your enemies. So if you have this exchange of fairness only, you're not reflecting the mind of God. Maybe you're not his child. That's the warning that's being given here. Rather, suffer wrong. Let people take advantage. That's fine because that's how we are with God and if he's our father, he's imprinting that character in us. The church becomes a place where we don't bring up wrongs, we don't harbor grudges, we forgive, we love, and in fact, on the contrary to the ways of the world, we bless, recognizing this is our calling. So, I hate to say, this law is way harsher than if I give you a list of rules, but this is what God wants us to know. And here's what's so amazing, again, remember that he is a God that you can give thanks to because despite our being such a sinful people, he does not forsake his own and he keeps sending the word and keeps calling you to repentance and restoration that you will obtain the blessing. So beloved, knowing who our father is, recognizing the kind of people we have been, let's confess our sins. God must punish sin. His wrath is upon all his enemies, but he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Rather, Jesus tells us that God in this way so loved the world that he even gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him that he is and he is the savior will not perish for their sins but instead be gifted eternal life jesus came and died for our sins he was made subject to the wrath and the curse in our place and now if you believe and confess jesus is the lord of all glory but that he took on flesh and was crucified, and death could not hold him. He was raised from the dead and now intercedes for you. You will be saved from the wrath of God that will be coming upon the ungodly. So, having heard, love the Lord your God with heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor, neighbor as yourself, did you do that good work demanded by the law? I confess that, left to myself, I am unable to do any good, because I am hostile to God and unable to subject myself to his law, and am even by nature a child of wrath. So, where's your hope to be found? I will place my hope in the work of Christ alone, who died for my sins and was raised for my justification, and who has become my righteousness and redemption, apart from my own works and attempts to keep the law. And having been redeemed because God loved you and sent his Son, how will you now live before God? I recognize my high calling, signed and sealed in my baptism, and will walk in newness of life, a slave to righteousness, under the sanctifying work of the Spirit, thankful to God for his blessings. And again, not moralistically, but with a thankful heart. Let us go before God and confess our sins and pray not only that we would be forgiven, but that we would be more and more conformed to his image. Almighty Lord of heaven and earth, we come before you a proud and boastful race, demanding that you be impressed by whatever works we bring to you and declare before all creation how we are better than our neighbor, and that is why we are Christians. We pray this day that your spirit will work in our hearts and humble us to realize that we are every bit as unworthy as every other. But it, you loved us. You wrote our names in the book of life. You chose to be our redeemer. You died the sinner's death in our place. Our salvation from beginning to end is because of your loving work for us. May we therefore of all people be the most humbled, the most thankful, and recognizing that we are indeed called to holiness, reflecting your character. 
we will more and more have a zeal in our worship, a joy that we belong to the body of Christ, a desire to love and serve one another, and let love cover a multitude of sins, that we never hold a grudge, we never demand revenge, but rather we bless, recognizing Christ came into a world of darkness who hated him, and he spoke the word of life and gave his life that those who were in darkness would have life. May we therefore more and more desire not to be moralists, but to be your sons and daughters who truly reflect a disposition and a character of love for God, love for neighbor, and pursue righteousness and holiness for the glory of your name. We thank you, O Lord, for this hope of life and the promise of everlasting life in Jesus Christ, all upheld by your unfailing, unchangeable work. For this we are thankful. Amen. Beloved, please stand that you would hear the words of absolution and be refreshed in your confidence and assurance of the love of God. Beloved of the Lord, to you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ, by the full authority of his word, your sins are forgiven and the record of your transgressions is blotted away and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ who will resurrect you in the last day. And so we have the word of the psalmist as we sing to God that indeed we desire to know him single-mindedly, the way he has revealed himself and not according to the confusion of men. So Psalm 119 verses 113 to 120, the double-minded I abhor, but how I love your law. Let us sing. The double-minded I abhor, but how I love your law, O Lord. You are my hiding place and chill. I've set my hope upon your work. Depart from me, you wicked men, that I may in God's love. Please be seated. Well, the command of God is not only for us to pursue righteousness and holiness, but also to be a light to the nations. That begins in our house, goes to our neighborhood, throughout our own country, and then to the ends of the earth. And so we see there this week the, both our church, our families, and the nations for which we will pray. Let's go before our God. Great God and Father, mighty in all creation, we come before you this day rejoicing not at your might but at your grace that you loved us and though we sinned against your holy majesty you have given us life by purchasing us with the shedding of your blood so we ask O oh lord that not only would we understand this we would believe it it would give to us joy and that our worship would be filled with enthusiasm and zeal as our love for you is restored when we consider that you loved us for no reason other than in yourself you chose to love us. May we therefore be confident you do not change, your love abides, and though we are not yet glorified, you will restore and uphold us, and you will use us as the body of Christ on earth. And so let us remember that the ones who are around us this day are your chosen ones. They are loved by you. We are therefore to love them 
as sons and daughters of the great king who will always protect his own. Let us therefore seek to understand the needs of others and knowing the gifts and talents we've been given to utilize them as a blessing for one another and recognizing our Father is aware of our own needs, knowing that he has sent many servants to assist us. So rather than being proud or boastful that we would graciously receive the encouragement and help that we need to mature and grow in the faith and for this assembly of believers, the body of Christ, to reflect the nature, character, and work of Christ as we build up one another and proclaim your gospel to the ends of the earth. Lord, we are thankful that we are not alone, but part of a large assembly of believers around the world that faithfully proclaim the pure word of the gospel. We thank you for the confessional, reformed, and Presbyterian churches that persevere and that speak the truth in love, that your people, the Christian people, demand to hear the truth and prevent ministers from speaking error, that you have raised up officers and ministers who love the truth and will speak it, preach the word, even when others would refuse. We thank you that in all these things you've brought us together, that we would desire and speak the truth, and we would all be blessed. We pray for the work in Ventura and in Armenia, of which we are part, but we also know there are works around the world, and faithful believers have been called by you to do this work. We ask that you would bless this for the glory of your name, and that your children would be encouraged that they see the power of their father defeating the kingdom of darkness by rescuing those who were in the strong man's house, but now have been set free because the gospel has given them life and raised them from the tombs. We pray this day for Kuwait. Lord, we know that the many Arabs of Kuwait are not even allowed to be evangelized by their government, and yet there are many believers that you've brought in from other lands. Lord, we ask that you will give opportunity for the believers not only to worship together, but to be able to proclaim the gospel to the people of Kuwait, and that there will be a regeneration of many and your churches will be filled and praise your name. We pray for Kyrgyzstan. And Lord, we are thankful the government does not allow militant Islam in the land, but we also know that Christians are seen as the foreign occupiers. Lord, grant that the gospel would go forth in that land and the many peoples who live there would know of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Savior, and that in these lands, the old Muslim and Mongol shamanist traditions would be taken away and instead the gospel would be proclaimed. We pray for Laos where the church has suffered greatly. And Lord, we know that many believers fled, but we know some have remained and you have called to yourself a new people also. We pray for the gospel to bring the word of life to Laos that they would turn away from Buddhism or communism and instead in Jesus Christ find hope not for this life alone, but for the next as well grant that there should be peace in this land that has seen so much suffering. We pray for Latvia, where foolishly people turn back to their ancient pagan roots, but now we pray that you will again bring the gospel to that land. We are thankful that in the past many there professed Christ as Lord, and that again that we should hear of the Latvian people turning to you. So we ask that you would grant mercy and that many would hear the gospel and live. We pray for Lebanon, knowing that in this land many are Christians purely out of political or ethnic markers, but now we pray for the gospel to once again bring life to this land that had heard the gospel shortly after Christ left the earth. We ask that the churches would again be filled with those professing your name and the ancient Phoenicians, the Arabs, and many others now who worship false gods would hear the gospel and again turn to you, and the darkness of Islam will be lifted from this beautiful land. We pray for Lesotho and for the church to no longer allow itself to be corrupted, especially with prosperity gospel, but that they would instead preach Christ and him crucified. And the people of Lesotho would know that you alone give life to the dead. And we pray for Liberia, knowing that there is great poverty, long-term effects of war. But Lord, you can give peace even to those who were sworn enemies. And we ask for the peace of Christ in this land that many would be blessed. But we are mindful of our own needs at home first and foremost. We have husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, moms and dads, and people struggle. There are difficulties. 
Some keep a brave face, others are hypocrites. Some renounce. Lord, we ask and we pray for each and every one that we are in contact with. And we ask that by your spirit, we will have the zeal of the widow and give you no rest till you hear our prayers and restore to us our loved ones. And we pray that we would also no longer be ashamed, but we would reach out to neighbors and friends and proclaim to them that they too need this life. We ask that your gospel would go forth and that the comfort of the gospel would be a blessing to many, many more in our nations, schools, our neighborhoods, everywhere. We are also mindful of those who are absent today. We know some are sick. We know some are traveling. Lord, we ask that you will restore their bodies, give them safe travels, but our hearts especially grieve for those who have known the truth but now don't care for it. Lord, we know that there is always flaws in us, but we ask that they be restored. We pray for those who have fallen away, for those who have fallen to chase after other gods. Lord, please do not allow their foolishness to prevent them from attaining the blessings, but rather by your power and spirit, as you brought us from the dead, that you would restore them to your body, the church, and that we should see your awesome power displayed as the fallen are restored and are thankful. So we come to you now confessing that we are indeed the most blessed, and we are blessed because we belong to an assembly of the saints whom you have loved. And all of us together can profess you are our God and Father as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now please stand for the reading of the written word. Hear then the written word of the Lord from the Old Testament, Psalm 146. Hallelujah. Play, praise Yahweh, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there's no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, hallelujah. Psalm 2, 11 and 12. Serve Yahweh with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. 41, 13. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. 72, 18 through 20. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. 89, 52. Blessed be Yahweh forever. Amen and amen. 106, 48. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen, hallelujah. 150, verse 6. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Turning to the New Testament, Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Acts 4, 11, and 12. 
This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time in this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes those tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith and salvation of your souls. Revelation 19, 1 and 2. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And Revelation 22, 20 through 21. He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Truly. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God, we pray that the revealed word from heaven through the prophets and apostles will now be made known and understandable to us, that we would know your mind, your will, and believe, and receive comfort, and be assured that the kingdoms of this world will perish as you establish your great unending kingdom of light and life, and we will praise your name, and the poorest, the weakest, and the despised of this earth will be blessed and rewarded, and therefore we are to give glory to him who will lift up the humble and the broken and give them everlasting life. May we therefore understand your revelation and be thankful of the word you have spoken. Amen. Please be seated. We have for some time referenced the Psalms, spoken of them in their context. Over the last several weeks, we've looked at different Psalms, especially ones that might be a little more confusing or more obscure in the hopes of opening up some of that book to us. We want to know what God has revealed. Blessed is the man whom the Lord has loved. But we have seen the blessed one is the one who walks in the way of righteousness. And we unfortunately have to wrestle with the fact that we have listened to the counsel of the wicked so much so that we have often trusted in the princes of this age. Whenever you see yourself caught up, anxious about the outcome of a political event, you are expressing you feel more tied to this kingdom of this world than the kingdom of God when we are more concerned about how people will vote or which propositions will pass or fail, and we are not troubled by the church losing, uh, by people walking away, by heresy being preached, if that doesn't bother us the same, unfortunately we have decided to put more confidence in man. We are hoping from earthly things to get blessings, and we are no longer confident that it is from heaven, through the church, that real blessing is obtained. What has happened through the book of the Psalms is the psalmist has recognized, this world hates me. This world hates my God. And though my God has made all things and made it beautiful and has given abundantly, 
the world continues to conspire against him, his house, his servants. And there are times when I see I'm having trouble believing if it's true. It is only God himself reminding me that yes, he continues to reign, that I am assured, though sometimes I even have to preach to myself, put your hope in God, because I'm not really hoping in him, because it does look like the wicked prosper, they die rich in their beds, while the righteous are poor and begging in the streets and are persecuted. And so we have the ups and downs of the Psalms. But we've also seen confident expressions. We have seen those times that we are reminded, no, God is all powerful. And I know in his temple, in his holy city, ultimately the Zion to which all the nations will come, God will be displayed as mighty Lord and King. From as early as Psalm 2, I know that the kings of this world need to submit to him if they are to find life because their kingdoms will not last. And if my hope is in their kingdoms, my hope will die with them. I see that the Lord will ascend. But one of the things that man has trouble understanding is that God is having for himself not the kingdom of creation alone, but a kingdom of the redeemed. And the redeemed will be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and that is God incarnate. And so he has to come and suffer. He has to be cast out from the temple. He has to be crucified. But when he is raised from the dead, he will have suffered and fulfilled the role of the lamb who, was shed, who sheds his blood and who is our substitute. And now he is able to ascend and sit on the throne and reign, and he is therefore our advocate in heaven. And now we are able to look and see, though I feel I am in the far off tents, though I am in a distant land, I can look to the mountains of Zion, and there my hope is found. And as I ascend the mountain of the Lord, there's this house being built up, and the house that the Lord builds will remain forever. And so when I have to leave that place of worship when I'm with the saints of God, Psalm 133, how blessed when all the saints are united in love. It is like the anointing oil, fragrant and beautiful, and a celebration that a priest is being installed. But we depart, and we hear the priests continuing to intercede for us, saying blessings upon you, Psalm 134. We go to Psalm 135 and sing the praises of God and all creation who made heaven and earth. So this dynamic is there of recognizing we are in the tents of Kedar, far from the land of God, but yet the Lord is with us and upholds us. And so each of the five books of the psalm have their own particular rhythm. And you can see here, Psalm 41, 72, 89, 106. These are the endings of each book of the psalm that speak of the blessedness of Yahweh, the glory of God, amen, truly. But Psalm 146 actually begins now the final closings, the final benedictions and the hallelujahs of the entire Psalms. So we're going to look today at what it means to be one who praises God. We're going to look to see why we should be confident of these things and what it means for us as a people who understand we are not yet in glory, but are assured not only does our Lord reign, but he is that mighty fortress in that great city that will cause the kings of this earth to beg for mercy. But while we are called to assemble together and sing the praises of God as we enter through the gates of righteousness with him who has sacrificed for us leading the assembly. So Psalm 146 begins with the words, Hallelujah, praise Yahweh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and I will praise him as long as I live singing praises to my God while I have my being. And in doing this, I do so expressly rejecting the princes of this world who are assembled against my God. I put no trust or confidence in princes. They are no different than me, mere mortals. They will not be able to bring anything to pass they can't even bring most of what they want now, but certainly once they die. So the praise of God, the confidence of his rule, 
means a rejection of the things of this world. Now we know we're sojourners, we're residents here. We're not cursing the world, we're not contemptible towards it. But our confidence lies in God alone. And so we praise God, even when the world thinks we should be doing other things, especially praising them. But what do the kings of this world bring to their followers? Now, archaeologically, or as historians, you look back and you can see these grand old castles and palaces, and of course the artist will render it as it was in its great most magnificent time. What's not shown? All the death. Almost every monument is built on the dead. And in fact, after the kings of this world send you out to die so they can conquer and get more gold, what do they do for your family? They build a marble statue glorifying themselves to speak of all those who died in their name. People obtain no benefit from the kings of this world. And so we have a king who instead dies for us. And the monument he wants is a broken and contrite heart that looks to him for hope. So of course we can praise the Lord as long as we live because we live because he has made heaven and earth and we have learned no longer to trust in the things of this age. Turning to the New Testament, Jesus tells the disciples, don't live like the Gentiles of this age, anxious, wondering if you'll get anything, knowing that at any moment the king will tax you, take away your property, take away your children to send them off to war or to become his concubines. No. Seek first the kingdom of God. And now we know that means seek first the good of Christ's body, the church, which is an embassy of the kingdom on earth. And everything else will be added to you. And so that's why you can say, I will praise the name all the days of my life because I don't waste my time putting confidence and waiting for redemption from earthly princes. They give me nothing. My God loves me and will give me everything. So seek first the kingdom of God and put no confidence in princes and your father knows what you need. You'll get what you need at the right time. Acts chapter 4. We can see the attitude of the powerful of this world. They reject the one hope of life given to the world, Jesus Christ. They despised his work and ministry. I mean, sure, I guess you can understand. He only fed the hungry, healed the sick, raised the dead, cleansed the lepers. What an annoying man. What did they hate about him? Because he showed their powerlessness and their sinfulness. He was able to love the people that they had contempt for. And they knew God had called them to be compassionate and loving. They had done it by measure. They met their 10% requirement, and after that, they were done. And Jesus gave up his glory to suffer and die for sinners. They felt it. They sensed it. They hated it. They rejected him. But he is the cornerstone of the house of God that is now being built up. And there's nowhere else to turn. So, of course, we should sing and praise his name because it is through his name we have life from the dead. And what is the kind of work that God does? Going back to Psalm 146, the God of Jacob is blessed because God is the helper. Now, understand what this means. The helper in Old Testament Hebrew is not the servant. The helper is the one who does what you cannot do. So in a way, if I have a brain tumor, the surgeon is my helper. He's the only one who can do something for me. So when God is coming as the helper, he's not coming as your servant, but rather as the one who does what you need so that you accomplish what needs to be done. He is the helper of Jacob. He is the hope, or he is the God who hope for those who hope in him. And should our hope be good? Yeah, as opposed to a king who rearranges a political order, he, our God, makes heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and maintains covenantal faithfulness, never, ever breaking a promise. Not just till now, not just until we annoy him, he keeps his promises forever and even restores us when we fall. And then you see here kind of a sandwich, seven clause one, who executes justice for the oppressed, and the end of verse 9, the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. And you can see partly how he does this by that middle section. 
He gives food to the hungry, sets the prisoners free, opens the eyes of the blind, lifts up the humble who are bowed down, loves the righteous, watches over those who have no country, the sojourners, and those who have no station in society, the fatherless and the widows. And while the wicked have been in the house of the king and have been building themselves up, he will bring them all to ruin. Everybody in the world thinks, no, the guys who have the money, the ear of the rulers, those who have the ability to send out their goons after you, they've got the power, but the homeless, the poor, they're nothing. Here we see the complete opposite. Those who have trusted in the Lord will be blessed. And those who have put their trust in princes, they will be brought to ruin and destroyed. Not man, but Yahweh, the Lord, will reign forever in Zion to all generations. So praise the Lord. So what about you and me today? Well, we're looking for the day of Revelation 19. We're living in the day of 1 Peter 1. We are those living in the dispersion. Not cool. But we are the elect exiles in the dispersion. Our names are still recorded in Zion. We belong to the city of God. For a little while we are exiles, but in this we are also ministers. We are called to bring the light of the gospel. And when we gather together, and we gather together with a zeal to love and worship God in spirit and in truth, and we love our neighbors and use our gifts for one another, this light shines brightly. And here, we are growing in sanctification, having been washed by the sprinkled blood of Christ, announcing grace and peace to one another and to the world. And God is glorified in all this, because he has made us to be the living church in the world. And the world hates us, the kings of the earth conspire against us, but we are being guarded through faith by the power of God, which will be manifested in the last day, at the right time. So rejoice now. Say, it's tough to rejoice. I'm mortal. Life is difficult. I see pains and troubles in the church and around the world. And notice Peter says, yeah, I know you're grieved by various trials, but this is a test. It's not a punishment. The punishment has already been poured out on Jesus Christ. For you, it is part of your training. And as we've said before, you have to put it in context. If you just go and see one man yelling at another in the field and throwing things at him and making him lift rocks, it could either be a crazed, maniacal torturer or a coach that wants you to improve. That's the question. Are these trials now coming from an enemy who wants us to suffer or from a father who is causing his children to grow as he knows they can, as he desires them to, in order that he can pass on to them their inheritance? We are, we should rejoice. And if you've ever seen the people who go through, again, boot camp, hell week, things like that in football training, yes, oh, they will grumble. But at the end, there's the satisfaction. Your name's on the roster. You are part of the elite. There is such a joy that comes with accomplishment. So rather than making Christianity this time of sitting back, you know, the hour of worship service, nothing else, no, no. It is a time that you're actually going to have to interact with people who are difficult. And you're going to love them. And you're going to know your own failings and work through them. And you're going to do this all with joy in God, confident that in this time of trial, you are being trained up to result in glory and praise and honor to you when Christ reveals himself and you praise and glorify him. Yeah, for a little while, we live on this side of eternity. We have not seen him with our own eyes. But because the Spirit of God has made us to live, we love him. We don't see him, we still believe in him and rejoice. That's why this morning you didn't sleep in like your neighbors. Go do to recreation. But you came to a place that marks you out. Everybody who saw you drive here knows 
there are still Christians in the world. Everybody who knows that you're not going to something else but you're here today recognizes you prioritize this time over the things of this present age which are passing away. That's a testimony. And when we are finally raised up to eternal glory, we will hear these sounds of hallelujah from the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the myriad and myriad of angels, as well as the host of those from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, uncountable, who are there before God, crying out to him, praise the Lord, hallelujah, because he did judge Babylon. He did destroy the prostitute, the kings of this age, who corrupted the world, led people astray, and shed the blood of the saints. We don't need to avenge it. God loves his own. He keeps a record. We right now are called to minister grace to others in this world. We're not anxious about the world. We don't fear the kings of this age, but we love the people and desire that they should obtain the blessing. If they stay in their foolishness, that's on their heads. But as for you and me, we display this time matters. The people of the church matter. We gather together because we love God. Because we love God, we love the ones he loves. Because this is his world, we give him this day. We gather together, we don't brag about what we've done, but we express our sinfulness and thank him for his grace. And Jesus says, I will come again soon. John looked and saw history laid out before him. He gives a theological interpretation of history and revelation. He sees everything is governed, not just by God the Father, but Christ the Lamb of God, who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. That's the image of the scroll. It's the command of the emperor to the governor. No one can accomplish the will of God except the slain Lamb, who is the Lion of the tribe. And he executes the will of God against the enemy, the Antichrist, the beast, the Babylonian woman. And in the end, they are destroyed. And John sees all this and he says, now, let's do this. Bring glory. Bring your power to the world. And Jesus responds, I will come soon, but not today. Today is still the day of your testing and mine. Today is the day that we still learn to love each other, to keep no record of wrongs, to search out what is my gift and talent by which I serve the believers and the church and provide for the mission of the church around the world, but also in my own family? How is it that I am called to bring the light of the grace of Jesus Christ to others when this is who I am? And Jesus says, well, because I chose you. So with this, we can go and boldly proclaim to the greatest, most powerful, and most evil king of this world, serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice in trembling. We offer the word of life, but as we suffer, sensing betrayal, Psalm 41, we can still say, blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, always, because he is faithful and true. And Psalm 72, we are confident, though we do not yet see the kingdom in its full majesty and glory, we know the kingdom will be from sea to shining sea, so we can say, blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel. He is alone doing wonderful things for us. And so his name should be blessed and glorified forever and evermore with the entirety of his creation filled with his glory. Psalm 89, again, remember that section of the exile. Yahweh is still glorified even if I am in Babylon where the prostitute drinks the blood of the martyrs. Well, we see Revelation 19, she will be judged. So yes, through this trial, I still bless Yahweh forever. End of book four, Psalm 106. Blessed be Yahweh as Christ is now enthroned. So those Psalms of the 90s are fulfilled and we live now knowing that the Lamb of God is reigning as king and also interceding for us. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people of every tribe and tongue and nation say, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And by the end of the entirety of the book of the Psalms, 
Let everything, everyone, everywhere that has breath, praise Yahweh. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Beloved, we, we go through a lot. This is a time of testing and suffering. The valley of the shadow of death. The time in which darkness is my only friend. Yes, there is the bad. But in all of this, the Lord is my shepherd remains true. In all of this, I will seat my anointed on the throne and all the nations will come. And you will be part of the instruments that God uses to bring this gospel message to the world. And there are already tens of millions, hundreds of millions of voices praising God. You're not alone. You're not sitting in the middle of the ocean surrounded by sharks hoping. You're part of a church that has been here for millennia around the world, preaching in hundreds of languages. We've got to get past any sense of helplessness or melancholy. Stop being anxious. Seek first the kingdom of God, knowing that all things will be good, and praise the name of the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Glorify God. Don't let the lying princes of this world deceive you about their power. Each of them will die. Their kingdoms will amount to nothing. Look at history. They're all gone. The ones that are present today, they'll be gone. And Christ's church will be filled with the sojourner, the widow, the fatherless, the poor, and the outcast being brought in, washed, clothed with royal robes to dwell in the house of God forever. Beloved, let us always praise our God as we have been commanded with joy. Don't forget. Don't lose your first love. Don't be lukewarm. Pursue zealously with love the praise of God and his glory. Let's pray. Great God, we thank you for the word of life. We are grateful that you know us well. You have revealed in your word all that we need to know, revealing to us that, yes, we are in a time of testing, though we may find it to be the deepest darkness, but you assure us you are there. Though we are fooled by the things of this world and we are anxious, you assure us that your kingdom alone will triumph. Though we grieve, as we know, the persecutions that the church faces, and we see Lady Babylon glorying in drinking the blood of the martyrs, yet you assure us of her utter destruction. And so give to us bold confidence to know that all things work together for good for those whom you have loved and called. We pray, therefore, that we will be able to no longer be corrupted by the false teachings of this age, but also not to fall into the trap of anxiety of the things that we cannot control, but rather that we will love you and we will pursue the glory of your kingdom, seeking first the kingdom of God, desiring the good of the believing community, especially the visible church. And Lord, we pray, may you be glorified in this assembly of believers, this random lot you gather together to be one body. May we find great joy as we look around us and realize these are the sons and daughters of God, the princes and the princesses of the great and eternal kingdom. May we live with joy among one another because we all love you and praise your name. Amen. So let's then continue by singing Psalm 146 and affirming that indeed we desire the whole of creation to praise the Lord. So Psalm 146, praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, my soul, O praise him, I will praise him all my days. I will sing while I have been. with 
Please be seated. The New Testament takes two examples from the Old Testament. One is that of those in the wilderness who have left the kingdom of slavery and oppression but are not yet in the promised land of glory being fed manna and also what we saw today from First Peter that we are the exiles, those who were part of a kingdom but now is spread out throughout the world but in this God is using us to bring the light to the nations. In both of these situations the people of God need to be assured. God has not failed us. He is not restricted to Zion or to Canaan, but rather he is all powerful. He goes to Egypt and rescues. He protects Daniel and his friends in Babylon. He is with us here. So beloved, in the Lord's Supper, we are receiving a testimony from heaven. You're gonna get earthly bread and wine, just like you only hear a man's voice, but it is God's spirit who works through the words that are given that he regenerates and make the dead to live. Though mere wine and bread will be received, it is Christ himself testifying of the reality of his active presence with you. Darkness is not your only friend. The eternal God is your loving father who upholds you. So we come to the table of the Lord in order that he would minister the gospel. Got the gospel through the word. Now you get the visible word of the gospel as well as a sealing sign and testimony to increase your confidence. We read in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. So do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. You profess your hope of life in his death until he comes. Therefore, whoever should eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord without trusting in Christ in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning, cursing the body and the blood of the Lord. So, for all who are living in rebellion against God and persisting in unbelief, this holy food and drink will actually only bring on your head further condemnation. So, if you do not yet confess Jesus Christ, seek to live under his gracious reign and identify with his people, we ask you to abstain. Nevertheless, despite these warnings, for anyone who has confessed your sins and affirmed your faith in Christ, be assured of this, God's promise cannot fail. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life and will not come into condemnation. You're being invited to this sacred meal, not because you are worthy in yourself, a perfect law keeper, but because you are clothed in him who perfectly kept the law, Christ, and you are given his perfect righteousness. So don't allow the weakness of your faith, don't allow the failures of the Christian life to keep you from coming to the table. This table is given to us as we are sojourning because of our weakness, because of our failures, to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As the word that you have heard has promised us God's favor, so also God, knowing our weakness, has added this visible confirmation of his unchangeable promise, the sacrament. 
So come, believing sinners, the table is set and ready for you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured for us a new and living way to the Holy of Holies, cleanse our minds and our hearts by your word and through the ministry of the Spirit, so that we, the people whom you redeemed, drawing close to you through these holy mysteries, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity through the body and blood of Christ, our Savior. Our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands. We know he is in heaven, seated at your right hand, continuing to intercede on our behalf. But through this mystery, by your own word and spirit, these common elements are now set apart from the ordinary use. They will remain bread and wine, but these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify, we do not doubt. Rather, we joyfully believe that we receive in this meal nothing less than Christ, his crucified body and shed blood. So now let us go to our heavenly table and receive the gift of God for our souls. Amen. Beloved, that we may be nourished with Christ, the true, true bread from heaven, let us lift up our hearts to Christ Jesus, our advocate at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us firmly believe every promise, not doubting he does intend to nourish and refresh us with his body and blood through the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit, as surely as the testimony gives it, we receive the bread and wine in remembrance of him. Lift up your spirits and hearts on high. We lift them up to the Lord. The elders will dismiss you to come forward and receive the elements at this time. Return to your seats and we will partake them together. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, unless you drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. But he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, because my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. So whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I will dwell in him. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him. Apart from him, nothing has been made that has been made. And in him is life. The life was the light of men. The light has shined in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of only begotten Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. So we come to him now, a living stone, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you now also are living stones being built up together into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that he may proclaim the excellency that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I urge you as aliens and strangers, abstain from this kingdom's fleshly lusts, which are warring against your soul. Keep your behavior among the heathen Gentiles excellent, so that though they may slander you because you do not follow their ways, on account of observing you, they will glorify God in the day of visitation. Be assured through every trial that is ordained for you 
This is by the wise hand of a loving Father who cares for you. He always provides for your success because he intends to bring you to everlasting glory. And so, beloved, there are times that we don't sense or feel these things. And that's why we are given not only the Lord's Day to hear the gospel, but the sacraments as well to be visible signs to give testimony to this reality. So you've heard, now see, touch, smell, and taste. Know that Christ is with you. Lord Jesus took the bread and broke it in the sight of his disciples and declared to them, this is my body, it's broken for you, and yet I am with you. So take, eat, remember, and believe my body given for your souls. Jesus also took the cup and declared, this cup is the new covenant in my blood ordained by God that there should be a new kingdom, a kingdom of the redeemed who will dwell in the house of God forevermore. Take, drink, remember, and believe Christ's blood shed for you, which purifies you and makes you fit to dwell in God's house forever. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that there's great mystery to this holy feast. We also recognize that we are unworthy to share this meal with you, but by your invitation and now dressed in Christ's righteousness, we've come boldly into the Holy of Holies, and rather than receiving wrath, we received your pardon. In the place of fear, you've given us hope. Our high priest and mediator of the new covenant has reconciled us to you, and even now is interceding for us at your right hand. So please strengthen us by these gifts, so that, relying not on the things of this world, but only on your promise to save sinners who call on your name, we may by your Spirit honor you with our souls and our bodies, to the honor and glory of your holy name. Amen. Beloved, we bring our offerings to God as we participate in the continuing mission and evangelism, which is the call of every believer and of the Church united. We all have different gifts and talents, different things we can do, but where we are able, we contribute for this as well as for caring for the needy poor of the church, and the collection plate is available as you exit. Now let us stand and sing of this, the promise of God and that which we shall see with our own eyes from earth's wide bounds, tribes and peoples from everywhere gathering together, praising the Holy Trinity. Let us sing our doxology in closing. Do not allow the people of this world to deceive you about the power of Christ, because now he who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask for or imagine, according to the power that is working within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And for you and me, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, to which indeed we were all called in one body, Christ's body, and be thankful. Amen.